The story starts with a chaotic scene. Heavy rain exposes a battlefield surrounded by bright red roses, like the blood staining the area. A prince walked through this war-torn place, heading toward the crucial point of the invading castle. He easily defeated every enemy in his path until he reached a corridor guarded by four soldiers. Among them, there was a woman disguised as a man, serving in the kingdom's military. The guards were waiting for the bell to toll, signaling that the castle's prince had escaped. However, Emperor Arnold Hain of Galkine arrived before that moment. He was the one who started the war and wouldn't spare the woman and her comrades until he achieved his goal. The Emperor slowly approached the enemy troops, and despite their anxiety, they bravely faced Arnold. However, just as effortlessly as before, he defeated them one by one until only the woman remained. Arnold broke the woman's sword, and in a final attempt, she tried to strike him just as the bell rang. Instead of a sign of hope, the tolling of the bell became the backdrop to the woman's death. Missing her strike, she fell victim to Arnold's blade, her life slipping away. In her last moments, she accepted her life without succumbing to pain, knowing that in her next attempt, she might avoid such suffering. After her essence merged with the infinite ocean of existence, Rishim Guard Wurzner found herself facing Prince Dietrich once again. She was pledged to marry him, but he was publicly humiliating her, calling her a schemer undeserving of someone of his class. He annulled the marriage before the crowd, but Rish remained unfazed, accepting her fate calmly. This angered the prince, but Rish had lived through this scene many times before and was no longer affected by baseless insults from a spoiled individual like him. However, she remembered a time when she wasn't as mature. The first time her fiancé broke up with her in front of the kingdom's nobles, she felt embarrassed in front of Prince Dietrich. She was accused of various crimes in front of everyone and banished from the realm forever. On that same night, her parents, who were part of the Wurzner family of dukes sworn to the crown, couldn't forgive their daughter's betrayal. So, in addition to being kicked out of the kingdom, she also had to face rejection from her own family. She wandered aimlessly, with only the clothes on her back, through the dark and lonely night. She walked away from the extravagant wealth of the bourgeoisie, where she had spent her entire life. Eventually, she stumbled upon a group of traveling merchants on their way to the next country for their expedition. The leader of the group was a kind-hearted man who decided to invite the lost girl to travel with his comrades. One of the companions wondered if it was a good idea, as beautiful women like her could be more trouble than the cargo they were used to carrying. Although amused, the leader, Tully, was more intrigued by the girl's silk dress, which shimmered brightly even under the moonlight. With his sharp wit, he deduced that she must be from Viscola, a sign of royalty or nobility. He made a sarcastic comment about how a noble like her shouldn't be on the dirty ground near the castle. Instead of being bothered by the taunt, she regained her composure and offered to sell a precious ring to the merchants. This audacious move brought a spontaneous smile to Tully's face, and soon, Rishi found herself inside the caravan with the merchant. As they sipped sake, they talked about their passion for their work, how they cherished the goods that ignited their hearts and could evoke the same feeling in buyers. It was this deep connection that gave the merchant's name a good reputation and ensured their business made a profit. According to the leader, this was the motto of the area trading company. These stories sparked a fire in young Rishi's eyes. No longer bound to the fate of serving egocentric princes as a luxury servant, she decided to begin a new chapter in her life by joining the traveling traders and becoming a merchant. Under Chief Tully's guidance, she learned all there was to know about trade. She embarked on a journey across the world, driven by her newfound dream of visiting every country. However, just as she was about to check off the last nation on her list, she found herself caught in a war and lost her life. In that moment, her mysterious ability to reset her life transported her back to the exact moment when Prince Dietrich annulled their marriage. This was only the first time she had been reborn. Bewildered, she recognized the same dress and ring she wore on that fateful day. At first, she thought it was a dream, but when she pinched herself and felt the pain, she realized she was facing exile from the kingdom once again. As her fiancé repeated his arrogant speech, she turned away without uttering a word. Even though she didn't understand how, she silently thanked the heavens for this second chance at life and embarked on a new adventure. Her only regret was not being able to carry more resources in her suitcase, which would have accelerated her journey. She attempted to locate Tully and his comrades, but arrived at the same place as in her previous life, only to find that the caravan of the trading company had already departed. Despondent, she rummaged through her belongings hoping to find some sign of destiny that would guide her in this new life. Eventually, she discovered a gift her grandmother had left her long ago, an illustrated book of foreign medicinal plants. Unlike her first life, Rishi now had the means and the time to return to her quarters. She used everything she could sell to cross the sea and study medicine. In her new pursuit, she delved deep into the knowledge of medicinal herbs, combining it with the business acumen she had gained in her previous life on Earth. 
Rishi became a successful healer, sought after to treat members of the high courts in distant realms, including Prince Kyle from a country in the far north. However, just like the first time, she found herself ensnared in another war and lost her life again. Yet, with each rebirth, Rishi's maturity continued to evolve, layer by layer, as she returned once more to the moment of her exile by Diatrich. Rishi, filled with disdain, bids farewell and embarks on her new journey with determination and careful planning. In her second life, she immerses herself in the study of a specialized field and becomes acquainted with a brilliant scholar, Dr. Michael Evans. When they meet, Rishi realizes that she knows Dr. Evans from her previous life. The two scholars collaborate on important research projects, and Rishi gains a fresh perspective on the past through their dedicated work together. With this newfound knowledge, she eventually parts ways with her mentor and continues her research independently. However, once again, her life is cut short by war, marking her third death. In her fourth reincarnation, she serves as a maid in a duke's mansion. And in the sixth, she disguises herself as a man and becomes a knight, participating in numerous battles. Throughout each of her lives, Rishi finds fulfillment and motivation in seeking new experiences and knowledge. However, no matter the circumstances, she consistently faces death every five years, whether by the blade of a sword in a brutal conflict or from the toll of excessive work. Determined to break this cycle and ensure a long and prosperous life, Rishi decides to change her routine. She alters her route from the palace to the street, hoping to change the course of her destiny. Instead of leaving through the main entrance, she opts for a different path that takes her behind the mansion. However, on her way, she encounters a man who sends chills down her spine. It's Emperor Arnold Hine. When she hears his full name and noble title, she finds it odd that he is known in lands he has never visited. To conceal the fact that she has already been killed by this man, she responds by saying that Arnold's reputation precedes him, and some inhabitants of the kingdom are aware of who he is. Despite this, Rishi was unaware that Arnold's father was still alive, which meant that Arnold was only the heir to his lineage, not yet the ruler. She couldn't come up with a convincing excuse quickly enough, so she decides to apologize for the inconvenience, and bids farewell to the noble. She takes off her shoes and jumps from the second floor balcony, but luckily, she escapes serious harm from the fall and gets up without major issues. She breaks the heels of her sandals in the process, and prepares for a long walk ahead. Arnold, who observed everything, becomes enchanted and curious about this eccentric maiden. He immediately orders a servant to prepare his horse. Meanwhile, Rishi, who is lost on her way, encounters some guards who alert Prince Diatrich about the girl's presence. The heir approaches, feigning importance and claiming that he understands the maiden's discomfort at hearing him condemn her so harshly. But as the future king, he sees it as his duty not to taint his family's lineage with the presence of a deceitful bride like her. Amidst this confrontation, Rishi puts her hand on her head and laments that she has placed herself in one of the worst situations in all her reincarnations. However, this action elicits an expected reaction from the egocentric prince, who interprets it as a sign that the girl has been broken by his decision, and her heart is so wounded that she has lost her sanity, wandering aimlessly through the city streets. This pushes Rishi to her limit, and she responds by calling the prince a fool and stating that sorrow is not something that can stain one's clothes, but rather the path one walks in life. She emphasizes that she is not saddened by the broken engagement. Her serious and direct demeanor leaves the prince in despair, causing his mask to slip as he realizes that Rishi has no consideration for him. This revelation makes those around them notice that it is Diatrich, not Rishi, who is being rebuked. Hearing this, the prince turns to his subjects in a fit of rage, demanding respect. However, Rishi calmly interrupts and reminds him that his role is to uplift the people, not to treat them however he pleases. She goes further, emphasizing that Diatrich is doing her a favor by allowing her not to have to look at his face ever again. Just as she is about to deliver the final blow, a young maiden named Marie intervenes, taking Diatrich's side and telling Rishi to stop bothering the beloved Prince Diatrich. With this, the prince becomes more determined to continue his little show. He points his finger at Rishi and claims that he could never get involved with a woman who disturbs a perfect maiden like Marie. However, Rishi doesn't back down and reaffirms her commitment to fulfilling the annulment agreement. She makes it clear that she will never cross paths with the prince again, but she wants everyone to know that it doesn't bother her at all. She used to think her worth was only tied to the chance of marrying a prince, but life has taught her that true fulfillment comes from her own achievements and efforts. Rishi also mentions that, despite any lies Marie may have told to incriminate her, she holds no anger towards the girl. She understands that Marie schemed all of this to marry the heir to the throne. 
However, she emphasizes that since this future was not even desired by herself, it holds no meaning for her. She acknowledges that sometimes it's necessary to yield to family wishes, but she believes that taking actions on her own is essential to feel complete as an individual. Having achieved her goals, she leaves the room. Dietrich follows her, ordering his guards to apprehend her. In a surprising move, she grabs her ex-fiancé's sword and attacks a man she perceives as a threat right in front of her. This man turns out to be Arnold once again, and he questions where she learned to do such things. The surrounding population is filled with fear and apprehension, as Arnold is known to be capable of decimating entire battalions without assistance. Rishi knows that her sixth reincarnation ended at the hands of this man, and that he will one day cause a world-spanning war, ultimately leading to her death. However, Arnold surprises everyone by dispelling his reputation as an ill omen. He kneels before Rishi and apologizes for his rudeness upon arrival. He asks Rishi for the honor of making her his wife. Arnold really tries to win Risha over, but she quickly says no. The tension is high, but Arnold just starts laughing, which confuses everyone, especially the other guy who likes Risha, Prince Dietrich. The prince is shocked to see his old girlfriend getting a marriage proposal right in front of him. Risha, feeling hurt and angry, wonders how Arnold, who had caused her so much pain, could dare to propose to her. At this moment, the king arrives in his fancy carriage. He's really angry with his son for messing up things with Risha and breaking off their previous engagement in such a mean way. The king thinks Risha should consider Arnold's proposal again. Arnold makes it clear that their past issues shouldn't create problems between their two kingdoms. Then, Arnold asks to talk to Risha alone. The king encourages Risha to hear Arnold out. Alone together, Arnold admits he's deeply in love with her. Risha is skeptical, thinking it's all just a play for power, but she knows she would have jumped at the chance to marry him in the past. But now, Risha has experienced so much more of life and knows there are many other choices. She's hesitant to marry Arnold, especially since he's been involved in wars and seems like a tough person to live with. So, she decides to see how serious Arnold is by making some demands. First, she wants her favorite trade company to handle all the wedding preparations, and Arnold agrees. Then, she asks for a private area to meet with people from other countries, which Arnold also agrees to since it's part of her role. Third, she wants to live separately from the emperor, and Arnold is okay with this too. The biggest thing Risha asks for is the freedom to go wherever she wants in the castle. She also insists that Arnold must not touch her. Arnold thinks these demands are a bit much. In the end, Arnold accepts all her conditions and takes his new fiancé to his kingdom, ready to start their life together under these new terms. On the way, Rishi has her time to develop the skills she acquired in her past lives. However, at a point in the journey, Arnold extends his hand towards Rishi. She reminds the young man that she demanded he not touch her. But he reassures the situation, saying he's just trying to retrieve the sword she slept on. Upon looking at the weapon, the girl wonders how she could have slept on the sword that impaled her previously. Next, Arnold informs her that he has scheduled a meeting with the trade representative Rish indicated, the area company. Since this company has managed to attract many clients around the kingdom, Arnold asks if Rish has done business with this company, but she responds that she only heard that they have good products. Internally, she knows she wants to maintain contact with Aria to develop her trading skills and reconnect with her friends, but she keeps this to herself. Also within her thoughts, Rishi notices the imposing beauty of her fiancé, and as she was looking at him with that admiring expression, he asks what's going on, but the suitor pretends that nothing is happening. At that moment, a group attacks the noble carriage, and Arnold instructs his fiancé to stay inside. Despite their request, Rishi is no tame animal and decides to open the carriage door with the hairpin she was using. Stepping out, she faces the conflict, with men dying in front of her. After the victory of the defense convoy, Arnold is nervous about having to face the enemies personally, so he orders the survivors to be captured. However, despite the battle being violent, Rishi notes that no bandit was eliminated. Unfortunately, one of her fiancé's soldiers was injured and upon examining the sword that hit him, Arnold sees that there is poison in the body of his warrior, and orders his subordinates to tie a band as close to the heart as possible, and then sup the poison out. Sting the sword where she analyzes that the poison was made from carotid grass and indigo mushroom. As the situation is delicate, the leader orders them to return to a hunter's guild, on the way it may have the antidote at hand. But before the return, Rishi takes responsibility for creating an antidote, and with the plants she had on hand, even though they were not as effective as she would like, she improvised enough to try to reverse the effect on the wounded man. Rishi, with the best intentions, is worried that the soldiers might doubt her ability to cure the poison. So, she decides to prove her remedy works by cutting her own arm with the poison sword. Arnold tries to stop her, but she's already made the cut. 
Calmly, she applies her homemade remedy to her wound and then offers it to the injured soldiers, giving them a choice between her treatment and suffering from the poison for days. The soldiers choose Rishi's remedy. While they're being treated, the prince's personal assistant wonders why Arnold needs guards if he can handle problems himself. Arnold explains that he can fight enemies alone, but having kingdom fighters show strength and importance. The assistant then asks Arnold why he's taking Rishi with him. Arnold says it wasn't his idea. Meanwhile, Rishi is out in the field gathering plants. Arnold finds her and asks how she got out of the carriage. Rishi reveals that in a past life, her boss would lock her in, so she learned how to pick locks. Arnold comments on how unpredictable Rishi is and wonders when she'll surprise everyone again with her unique way of doing things. Rishi doesn't appreciate his tone, feeling like he sees her as some kind of exotic animal. She tells him she's never done anything just for his entertainment. Arnold then humbles himself and shares about the night Rishi is helping, who used to live on the streets. He explains that even in a society where merit is valued, people are often judged by their origins. Despite this, he chose to become a warrior and faced many challenges along the way. Even when he was not fully prepared for the mission, he committed himself to training and being ready for this crucial moment. Rishi listens carefully to Arnold's story and realizes he truly values the soldiers who fight alongside him. Arnold appreciates these men and thanks Rishi for helping them, which surprises her. She thought he wasn't the sentimental type. Despite her doubts, she politely responds that she just used her knowledge. However, some of Arnold's warriors are still unsure about her, especially after hearing about her broken engagement with Prince Dietrich. They suspect she might not be trustworthy. Arnold reassures her, explaining that in his family, the Empress is traditionally from a royal family of another country. So, despite the challenges, Rishi should not worry, everything will work out over time. He admits that people in Galkine can be harsh, implying that Rishi might be treated like a hostage due to their customs. This revelation oddly pleases Rishi, as it means she can relax and avoid formal duties. She takes this opportunity to remind Arnold of his promise to hold her hand. They eventually arrive in Galkine, a city renowned for its power and wealth. Rishi has never been to this city in any of her past lives, and she finds the capital bustling and welcoming. At Prince Arnold Hines' mansion, they learn that the countryside house they were supposed to stay in is not ready. Rishi is told she'll have to sleep in the guest room, but she insists on staying at the countryside house, regardless of its condition. Arnold objects, saying the place hasn't been used in a long time and is in poor shape. Rishi, determined, says she doesn't mind and reminds Arnold that she's a hostage in this situation, so he should treat her as such. Arnold is puzzled by her amusement with this idea. When they get to the countryside house, Rishi sees it's dirty. She uses her past life experience as a servant to start cleaning, asking the guards just to move the furniture. While cleaning, Rishi remembers a troubling thought. Arnold will eventually kill his father, the Emperor of Galkin, leading to war. She feels a strong need to prevent this, as all her past deaths are linked to war started by Arnold. Rishi resolves to do everything she can to avert the war, hoping for a peaceful and prosperous life without these conflicts. While all this is happening, a scene unfolds with a maid being picked on by others who boast about being the future maids of the crown princess. But then, the princess herself, Rishi, appears and sees the girl on the ground. The mean maids, not recognizing their future boss, keep gossiping. They brag about their three months of experience and are determined not to lose their jobs. Rishi steps in and puts the boastful maids in their place. She advises them not to wash the curtains now as the days are long in spring and there's enough time for things to dry. She warns that it might rain later, which could wet the already dried clothes. The leader of the mean maids questions how Rishi can predict the weather. Rishi explains that the type of clouds and birds flying low indicate rain. Washing big items now could mean extra work later. Despite her advice, the experienced maids, full of pride, ignore Rishi and leave. The mistreated maid introduces herself as Elise and thanks Rishi for standing up for her. Rishi, wanting to help more, offers to wash Elise's dress quickly before the rain because it's a light fabric and will dry fast. Elise is touched by Rishi's kindness and wonders who this helpful girl is. But Rishi keeps her identity a secret, urging Elise to wash her clothes soon to avoid the rain. Hours later, Rishi relaxes on her new home's balcony feeling satisfied that she's now visited every country on her list, something she couldn't do in her previous life as a merchant. While reflecting, she notices Arnold and asks if he always slips away from his duties so easily. Arnold, trying to stay unnoticed, is surprised by Rishi's sharpness. Rishi teases him, saying he picked the wrong wife if he wanted to stay under the radar. She figures out Arnold has been adjusting his presence to see when she would notice him. Then Arnold asks what Rishi is looking at, and she points out a large building. Arnold tells Rishi that the building she's looking at is a library filled with books from all over the world. 
When she asks about a beautiful tower, he explains that it's the central church with a clock. The bell in the tower rings at specific times to remind everyone of the time passing. Rishi, full of excitement, keeps asking about everything she sees from the balcony. She wonders why one street is particularly busy, and Arnold tells her it's the busiest commercial street in the imperial capital. But Arnold seems a bit overwhelmed by Rishi's constant joy and curiosity. He asks why she's so happy, especially since she was pressured into marrying someone from his country. Rishi shares her love for the city. She had always heard about Galkheim but never visited it. Now that she's here and sees its lively streets, historical buildings, and welcoming people, she finds it amazing. Arnold realizes he has never met anyone like Rishi. He's impressed by her confidence, intelligence, and physical abilities. He remarks that no other noble lady he knows has ever shown such quality. This comment reminds Rishi of her mother, who used to say Rishi, as a duke's daughter, only needed to marry well and have children. Feeling emotional, Rishi speaks up, asserting her independence. She describes herself as an adventurer exploring life's mystery, valuing personal achievements over social status. Arnold agrees with her and promises to support her. As he prepares to leave, Arnold suggests Rishi make another request since he broke his promise not to touch her. This leaves Rishi thoughtful, wondering if Arnold might have ulterior motives she hasn't yet realized. This bring an end to our episode. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe for next episode.